AI is really something, but is it really ready to take over the universe or even your line of work? We're on location here at Boston University Questrom School of Business with Professor Mohammed Saltaneha, and welcome to the Language of Business. Thank you for having me. Mohammed, how do you define artificial intelligence? That's a really good question. I would say we don't have a single definition for what is AI, but I, I'll try to give you a couple different variations here. Because when you talk about AI, in some cases, people are thinking of like narrow AI when they say AI. For instance, you have an algorithm that uh, helps you to unlock your phone. That algorithm is doing a really good job in one single task. And that is a, a narrow AI. It's trying to mimic what uh, humans cognitively are able, capable to do, recognizing someone's face. When we talk about artificial general intelligence, AGI, that is the case, humans trying to reproduce human brain. And we are at least decades away from that in best estimate. You know, that is a scenario with uh, when people think that a lot of the jobs that are intellectually difficult and designed for humans are going to go away, are going to go to the machines. Uh, that's the kind of AI people are thinking about. You're a faculty member here at Boston University Questrom School of Business. How do you define machine learning, big data, and cloud computing? So I am involved in a couple of different research areas. For instance, one of the areas I have been involved in the past is uh, working with medical images. And uh, using these images, we're able to design machine learning or AI models that can uh, detect cancer, for instance. And the nature of the problem uh, is that we have a lot of data. You're talking about terabytes of data. Processing them requires a lot of compute power. And uh, what public clouds allow us to do is to tap into a lot of resources when we do need them uh, for a short period of time. Let's say for the next eight hours, I might need a 1,000 computers. And I do not need uh, you know, more than one after that. And yeah, the machine learning aspect of it is that we are trying to automate a lot of the tasks that our humans are good. For instance, in terms of the medical application, we have uh, a model that can predict or can detect cancerous cells versus normal cells. And this is something that once designed and done properly, and uh, let's say if you can perfect it, it's very easy to replicate and send it all around the world, places that access to pathologists is very rare. Uh, we would have a machine that is going to be able to do as good of a job as a, an average pathologist that you can find. That sounds great. Now let's talk about AI trends. Where do you see the technology going in, say, the next three to six months? I would say any successful application that will come out of it is going to be based on a very particular, very narrow side of AI. That, that is something it's easy kind of to predict, and that is deep learning. Deep learning is a subset of AI, which is actually deep learning is a subset of AI called machine learning. Machine learning is another subset of AI itself. So this is the situation when we have um, the, we, we build a model that is able to learn from the data itself, as opposed to we define rules for this model to follow them and allow the humans to trust that solution. An example would be you would trust your phone to take you from point A to point B while you're driving. And you have your skepticism because the phone you know doesn't know everything. If the road was closed five minutes ago, your phone might not be aware of. But in general, it will have a better idea of the traffic at that very uh, moment it would know the, the best route. And uh, for instance, with Google Maps, it can even tell you which route you would consume less fuel and so on. So that is a successful application of AI. I anticipate we will see more and more of those applications in the, in the near future. And um, it's almost guaranteed the successful ones will be based on deep learning. And how would that answer change over the next five years? That would be uh, very difficult uh, to predict for the next five years. But uh, I would say uh, there is a lot of effort in terms of battling climate change and how AI is going to be successful in doing that. The other aspect of it would be, it's not just uh, building the applications, but how we would use them as a society, how much of the power 
of uh, the data generation, data collection that is happening right now will be given back to the consumers as opposed to uh, government entities and companies. So we have to define or redefine a lot of the privacy uh, laws when it comes to data and AI and personalized medicine. Previously, we weren't able to process all of the, the data, but now with the AI help, we would be able to do that. We can take you know patient's DNA and we can process that uh, within a matter of uh, minutes or hours and within you know a reasonable cost. And that area is going to significantly change within the next five years. Everyone these days is talking about chat GPT. Do you really think it's the future or just a passing fad? Chat GPT is a very interesting technology. It's uh, the currently uh, the most publicly available natural language uh, algorithm that is able to generate text for, uh, you know, based on a given input, for instance, you can ask it a question or give it some data. And uh, based on that, it will generate text for you. And it would be really hard for a human to say whether this was generated by a computer or by a human, right? So in one sense, uh, it is able to um, pass a basic Turing test. There are different versions of that. But uh, I I definitely think that uh, we are we are going to make uh, bigger and bigger progress uh, on that uh, in that area. For instance, the customer service industry is going to be impacted by uh, something like Chat GPT without having that phase that the human on the other side getting frustrated by a weak uh, capability or weak language of the current chatbots are, um, you know, are, are designed with. So uh, I think, I think this is something that w will stay, uh, stay around. And uh, we would uh, even have to expect, you know, in the next few years, even better and better versions of uh, such technology. Mohammed, thanks so very much. It's my pleasure to be here. Thank you, Greg. Professor Mohammed Sultane Ha here at Boston University Questrom School of Business, talking about AI and deep machine learning. Are you a problem solver? Do you see the big picture and the small details? Want to turn big data into big decisions? Take AI to the boardroom. Translate rocket science into the science of business. Build your career at digital speed with a master of science in business analytics. Be ready for careers like analytics consultant, data science, analytics strategy, data translator, BI analyst, technical business analyst. 10 months and you're in business analytics. AI means so many things to so many different people, but when it comes to implementing AI, how does an executive know what to do? We're all okay with Pei Kota Bandalu, guest researcher at the UMass Lowell Institute, and welcome to the Language of Business. Thanks, Greg. It's nice to be here. Nice to have you here, Pei. How did you initially get involved with AI? Well, I've been solving a problem for a client for the past three years. It involved uh, reading a lot of documents, very technical documents, and we got sick of reading the documents and we decided to help the computer do some of the reading for us. Uh, and so we've been teaching this piece of software, this piece of AI, how to read the documents of this particular client, tell us what we need to pay attention to and what we don't need to pay attention to. Let's say I want to begin incorporating AI into my business what are my first steps? And frankly, how should I manage my expectations? AI is actually so confusing uh, that I decided to write a book about it where I just do the basics. What do you need to ask? And if somebody comes in and says, you need AI, what are the top questions you should ask and keep asking? Do we know what we need? How good are we at building software? And then what kind of AI are you building? Are you building machine learning, an expert system, or are you trying to build a combo? The economic model of software for the past 25 years since the dot-com era has been minimum, minimum, minimum upfront investment, prove the business model, uh, start raking in the cash, and then we can fortify the, the systems architecture, build whatever technology we need to, to scale, and then let's just start reaping in the rewards. AI requires investment in design, data analysis, creating lexicons, language, and working with experts, and it's not cheap. It requires a lot of upfront investment. You reap the rewards of AI many years later, like we did with the corona vaccine. You just mentioned three types of artificial intelligence. Can you give us some detail on each of them, please? 
there's expert systems, machine learning, uh, and then there's combinations. An expert system, you start out, instead of looking at a big, deep data pool, what you start out with is, who are my experts? You gather your expert team. Because the first thing you're going to do is you're going to ask the human experts to explain what's going on in this complex system. What are its rules? Like, how does the human cell work? Or what's the genetic code? These are the things that have to be described for the machine. And then testing to see if the machine understands. And these are where the subtleties of AI change. For example, in machine learning, once you've built the AI and you teach it uh, and you try it out to see how it works, if your training has been incorrect in machine learning, you got to scrap the thing. It's not like a program where you can go in there and refine it a little bit. You toss it, you start again. This is something that's not known. Expert systems, no. Expert system AI can be finagled much like a program where you can go, this part is wrong, let's chuck that. The way the two approaches differ is, do you first help the machine using human experts, which involves investment, money, and time, which is why very few do it. For example, you hear, we got the coronavirus vaccine out really quickly because of AI. Okay, so I suppose AI is like a toaster oven. You put the toast in there, you push the button, and then the toast comes out, okay, like a, a vaccine. It is accurate that AI helped with the coronavirus vaccine. However, that AI was built on top of four generations of AI going back to the work that was done to the human genome mapping, and then the next generation, which started to apply it to genetics, and then the next generation started applying it to therapies, and then eventually we applied it to a vaccine, and at this point, we've done four generations of AI. But all you hear in the media is we used AI to solve the vaccine. Oh, can I have that toaster oven? I want to put my toast in it. So to start with, you've got to have an organization that's dedicated to that sort of R&D, let's say like an IBM. If you recall, for example, it took IBM many generations of Watson before it actually started beating the chess players. It used to be a joke at the beginning. The way to do AI, in my opinion, is the expensive way. You build an expert system first. You train it using human subject matter experts. You put it through its paces. And then once you know the rules of the system better, you start applying machine learning. There you have your combo architecture. Like everything else in software, it's a broad term. And it, it's if you define it too quickly and too narrowly, you miss a lot of important details. Pei, thanks for joining us today on The Language of Business. Thanks, Greg. It was a pleasure to be here. Pei Kota Bandaloo, guest researcher at UMass Lowell Institute, asking the question of what do I need to know about AI and how do I incorporate it into my business?